I don't remember your name. But I remember that I love you. That's what a woman with Alzheimer's told her granddaughter. There are no drugs that cure Alzheimer's. There are no drugs that delay the onset of Alzheimer's. And there are no drugs that slow the decline. So why should you care? 20% of women and 10% of men will suffer from Alzheimer's in their lifetime. And 100% of their families will be affected emotionally, financially, and physically. Finding a cure for Alzheimer's is hard, but we have to take on hard things to solve hard problems. My first experience of taking on something hard was when I was 10, learning to ski. I grew up in Canada, in Calgary, where it gets to be minus 40 degrees, which is the same in Fahrenheit and in Celsius. <laughs> and you know that if you live somewhere where it gets that cold. <laughs> My family didn't ski, and I have never liked being cold, but I signed up. And if you're not a skier, that is not good form. <laughs> I came back from the first day and my mom said, well, how did it go? And I said, mom, I fell 15 times. And she said, well, that, that's pretty good. And I said, mom, I fell 15 times going up the rope toe to get to the top of the bunny slope. <laughs> Coming down was way worse. <laughs> so learning to ski, there are harder problems, but for me, doing something that I once thought was impossible and becoming comfortable with it became the source of my strength to take on harder problems. I stuck with it, and five years later, it became my identity, and I absolutely loved it. In Alzheimer's, there have been 150, more than 150 drug failures in clinical trials in the last 20 years. The researchers who have been working on these drugs have seen failure over and over again, and yet they continue to get back on that slope and try again. These are people who know more than anyone else about Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is among the hardest of hard things, and if anyone knows it, it's those scientists who have seen their own family members and friends pass from the disease while still trying to find a cure. One thing that's gotten us a step closer to understanding Alzheimer's was the completion of the Human Genome Project. This was a massive, collaborative, multi-billion dollar effort that was global recognition of the importance of genetics in medicine. It was declared completed in 2003, which is not that long ago. And what it was was sequencing one genome start to finish with all of the letters which is the equivalent of a book with 10 million pages. So there was this cultural belief at the time that once we had this book, that we would have the answer to everything. But in reality, it took a lot of work to understand how this book makes a human being and how differences in books make people more susceptible to disease and different from each other. And up until that point, we had described almost every disease as a set of symptoms. And it took about 10 more years to start identifying some of these genes and to find individual letters in these books that led to rare disease and changes across sentences in chapters spread across the book that led to traits like eye color and height. So to give you an example, let's look at this photo of a large family. I did not get this from awkwardfamilyphotos.com. <laughs> this is my family. <laughs> my grandparents are in the front, in the center, and my mom is in the back in yellow and blue. 
And my mom has two sisters and five brothers, and five brothers work together, and no one could tell them apart. They're all about 6'2", 6'3", and they have these incredible mustaches. <laughs> There's no single Tom Selleck mustache gene, but you can see that there are clearly genetics involved in these traits. So these are traits that you can see from the outside, but there are traits on the inside, like heart size, lung shape, that are also influenced by genetics. And the same is true of common chronic diseases. This is what we're talking about when we, we talk about the nature-nurture spectrum. So this is on the, the, the nature side. Diseases or conditions that are entirely driven by genetics that are on one end of the spectrum would be those like cystic fibrosis or, uh, or Down syndrome. But most diseases fall somewhere along the middle of the spectrum. So in, in Alzheimer's, on the nurture side, there are some environmental risks that we can mitigate and do something about to decrease our risk. So things like getting seven hours of sleep per night and eating a Mediterranean diet, and being physically and socially active. And before the Human Genome Project, we knew about a handful of genes. We knew that there were rare familial genes that were exceedingly rare in the population, but that led to early onset forms if you had it. We also knew about a gene called APOE. So think of three friends or people that you work with. So statistically, either you or one of these people are a carrier for a form of the gene called APOE4, which give, uh, gives increased risk, significantly increased risk for getting Alzheimer's disease, but in no way guarantees that you will actually get the disease. And then we also knew that family history was a risk, but we didn't know which genes were contributing to that other than these high-impact genes. After the Human Genome Project, since the Human Genome Project, there have been studies of more than 100,000 people on Alzheimer's disease. And from those, we've found an additional 25 genes related to disease. So we actually know quite a lot right now. So getting back to drug development, why is it so hard? It's hard for five reasons. It's hard because we have to know what's causing the disease. We have to find drugs that actually properly address that cause. We need to know the right dose to give it. We need to know when to give it. When is it most effective? And then lastly, we need to select the right patients. And getting all five of those things right at the same time is exceptionally hard. In cancer research, the Human Genome Project made a huge difference. We now have drugs that work for certain people and specific types of cancers and tumors, and we can identify the people who are most likely to respond to those drugs. And so this is now the standard precision medicine approach in cancer drug development, and I think we can now apply it to Alzheimer's disease drug development as well. Scientists are taking more diverse approaches than we have ever taken before. We're developing drugs that target different parts of and causes of the disease, and scientists are trying to work out what dose to give those drugs. My company, Vivid Genomics, our goal is to use genetics to identify the right people for the right time. So we know that there are genetic similarities of people with Alzheimer's, but the differences matter a lot too. And the genetics influence when someone gets the disease and how likely they are to decline and perhaps whether or not they'll respond to a certain drug. So I saw an opportunity in genetics to make this problem of drug development a little bit easier, to increase the chances that any given drug approach could be successful so that drug, drug developers can have, find drugs that work for multiple patients, and more importantly, for people to have access to drugs that work for them. I started my company because 
The idea that my experience in passion in genomics could make a difference in the lives of a lot of people really got to me. And I knew that I had to try, even though it would be hard. And as long as we collectively commit to taking on these hard problems, to taking new approaches and being willing to fall down again and again, possibly for years, but continuing to learn and get better, we'll eventually get to a solution. There's a drug that's being submitted to the FDA in a couple of months from now. And even if it's approved, it is unlikely to cure the disease on its own. And it may not work for everybody. But it's prom it feels promising and it feels like we're getting closer. No one who works on Alzheimer's disease will tell you that what they do is easy. But it is so important. I showed you that picture of my grandparents. They held huge family gatherings, as you can imagine. They traveled together, and they were each other's favorite fishing buddies. And they fully enjoyed life together until my grandfather passed away suddenly with my grandmother by his side when they were both in their 80s. They were role models for family and growing old together. We were fortunate. They did not have Alzheimer's. I know how lucky I was to have them in my life and to have their humor and their stories and to share experiences with them until they died. And I never took that for granted. Some people are inspired by what they've lost, but I've been inspired by what I've had. We need to take on these hard challenges to find solutions and like all of medicine's big problems, we need a lot of people to get involved to do this. It shouldn't be down to luck. We should all have the ability and the potential to be with our loved ones and to have connections with our loved ones until they pass. And we need to take on these hard things to solve hard problems. Thank you.